Okay, welcome to Western Avenue Baptist Church this evening. Um, we're going to be doing the Mark Lecture with uh, Terry Norris. Let me go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this opportunity to be able to come to your word. Uh, Father, our prayers do go out to those in uh, Uvalde, Texas, and those who have um, been affected by that terrible tragedy out there. Father, we pray that you be with those families. Help uh, bring them comfort, but more importantly, help uh, bring them to a knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for continued safety, even in this community as well as we have experienced uh, similar, though not to the same degree, kind of violence uh, this past week. It's a reminder that we are indeed in a fallen world. Uh, Father, be with us tonight, though, as we go back into the book of Mark. Few things better than to study uh, the life of your son, Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for our brother, Terry, who has put his time and effort into studying this. And we pray that that would be fruitful for all of us who will hear it, either here in person or on the live stream. And we just pray that your name would be glorified in all things. We give thanks to you and pray all these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, well, we, uh, we are in uh, Mark chapter 4, just finishing studying the parables that uh, are listed for us there. We finished our discussion of the parables pretty much last time we went through them. We talked about the fact that the parables are intended to give information for the people who are part of the kingdom of God, but the, uh, the negative aspect of the par parables is that it hid that information from the people who didn't belong to the kingdom. <clears throat> That's kind of where we left off, so tonight we want to... Uh, kind of get a summary of those parables. If those parables are intended to uh, teach us about the kingdom, it's nice to know what they teach us about the kingdom. Okay. So last, uh, last week, last Monday, not this week, but last week, as I was going through this, it, some ideas hit me and I thought, oh, that kind of makes sense. So as to what each parable t teaches us about the kingdom, so we'll present those to you, and you can take them or leave them, whatever you want. So um, now Jesus' purpose here throughout the Gospels, not just Mark, but all of the Gospels, is to transition Old Covenant Jews from their Old Covenant understanding of God's kingdom to a New Covenant understanding. All the time, all the conflicts he had with the Pharisees, and the religious leaders, um, related to understanding the law. I'm going to give you a hand on this in a second, so you don't have to write it down. <laughs> okay. um, the, the Pharisees, you know, said you have to obey the law to the letter, and Jesus said, well, there's more to it than that. You know, it, God's more concerned about your heart than he is about whether you go to the temple on a regular basis or whatever. So he was constantly trying to, to increase their understanding, transition them to that new covenant. Hebrews chapters 8 through 10 kind of show that uh, focus. In chapter 8, the writer quotes from Jeremiah 31, or Jeremiah gave the new covenant and he explains the reason God promised a new covenant is because the old one didn't really do the job. It, it did what it was supposed to do for the time being, but it wasn't the final word. Paul talks about this in more detail in, in the book of Galatians. So it was time to transition. 
Galatians 4.4, 4, you know, at the right time, Christ, or God sent his son and introduced the new idea, the new covenant. So the problem, the main problem with the old covenant, the writer to Hebrew says, is that it had no provision to enable the people to obey it. It was an external set of guidelines imposed upon them. And they had to obey it, but with their sinful nature, they couldn't do that. And so God established the sacrificial system. When you break the law, these are the sacrifices you have to offer to get forgiveness for breaking the law. And so they, God never really expected the people to obey the law, and so he gave them that way to overcome the disobedience. But with the new covenant, it's an internal law. He says he'll put his laws in our hearts. Paul talks about this in Romans 7 when he says, I know I'm a child of God because I don't want to sin anymore. I don't want to please God. So instead of the old covenant where you had to obey the law or else you obey or die, the new covenant makes you want to obey and it enables you to obey. That was the reason for a new covenant. And in chapters 9 and 10 of Hebrews, he shows how that works out in real life. Jesus was that final sacrifice for sin. So there is no more need for any sacrifices. His was the final one. And that's the new covenant. So Jesus is trying to transition the Jews from the old covenant understanding to the new covenant understanding, that ultimate freedom. <clears throat> So the parables then are intended to illustrate the nature of the kingdom of God for its true members and to hide it from those who have already rejected the kingdom. We saw that in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Jesus said he gives it in parables so that those who don't understand or don't want the kingdom won't be able to understand. But he explained it to those who were uh, members of the kingdom. So they got the information, but the the people who resisted it didn't. So the following chart then uh, summarizes the nature of the kingdom as illustrated in the parables as presented in Mark 4, verses 2 through 34, 32, excuse me. Um, so the chart that you're about to get here has the little introduction that's on the screen there on, on it already and the chart. And uh, again, as always, these handouts will be available online eventually. <clears throat> so the chart that you have is already filled in, but um, for the screen here, we're gonna do it one box at a time. All right, just for emphasis, okay. I wish I could do that on the charts that you have. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> So, it's titled up there, The Nature of the Kingdom of God, according to the parables in Mark 4, 2 through 32. And of course, the rest of the Gospels are full of parables as well, different ones from what Mark gives. And later on in Mark, we'll see other ones as well. And then the headings there, we have the verse where the parable occurs, and then the title for the, for the parable, and then the aspect of the kingdom that the parable illustrates, and then a description of that aspect okay so the first parable is in verses 2 through 20 and that's the parable of the sower and the soils the sower goes out and spreads the seed and some falls on good ground some falls on thorny ground some on rocky ground etc so what aspect of the kingdom does that illustrate it's the basis of the kingdom the kingdom is based on the sowing of the seed now people as the description there says you know, God, God's word uh, is spread wide, but people respond to it differently. So the basis of the kingdom is related to the spreading of the word. That's how the kingdom functions. Uh, uh, Romans ten seventeen, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the kingdom is spread by, or is planted, I guess you could say, <laughs> by the, the, the spreading of the word. 
verses 21 to 23, the second parable is the parable of the lamp. And this talks about the purpose of the kingdom. And the purpose of the kingdom is um, yeah, that it spreads light for everyone's benefit. And we have a whole line of verses there. We're not going to look up every one of them. But uh, John chapter 1 talks about Jesus as the light that lights every man. He wakes everybody up to spiritual reality. Not everybody responds, as we saw in the first parable. But that's what he does. In, um, back in, in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, uh, the word of God is incisive. It cuts in and exposes who you are so that you can respond to it. And James talks about that, James chapter 1. Uh, the person who looks at the word and pays attention to it is improved, but the one who looks at the word and doesn't pay attention to it has no benefit, but is therefore benefit. So the purpose of the kingdom is to spread that light. And the third parable, verses 24 and 25, is a parable of the careful measure and that tells us about accountability in the kingdom. All are personally responsible for how they apply the kingdom message. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 8, this is at the end of a section when Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians not to argue about who the best teacher is. He says, we're all teachers. You know, we all do our job as teachers, but the teachers will be responsible for how they handle that. Okay? So there's responsibility for their part in the kingdom. And then in Matthew 25, we have a parable of the man who went on a journey and left his money with his servants to make more money for him, and they are rewarded according to how well they did that. So whatever benefit we have from the kingdom, we're responsible for how we handle that and are rewarded accordingly. And the fourth parable is, oops, forgot to put that up there, sorry about that. Um, the fourth parable then is the self-growing seed, and that tells us about the growth of the kingdom. And the kingdom grows by divine activity, not human activity. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I will build my church. He's the one in charge of that. We are not. We have responsibilities within the church. And we are responsible for how we handle those responsibilities, as we saw in the previous parable. But God is the one who is in charge of the results. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 8, that's the extended context for verse 8, which we saw in the previous parable. He talks about the different teachers. The teachers, you know, one watered and one laid the foundation, and but God, he says, gives the increase. God is the one who's responsible for that. We have the same idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 regarding spiritual gifts. <clears throat> it says that the Spirit distributes the gifts, and the Son orchestrates the operation of the gifts, administers the gifts, and the Father is in charge of the results. So we have our part. We need to exercise the gift. But God is the one who decides uh, how it's going to turn out. I think it was John Adams who said that uh, something like responsibility, no, obedience is ours, results are God's. You know, so we have the things to do that we have to do. <laughs> but God is going to arrange it to come out the way he wants it to. And then the last parable we see is the parable of the mustard seed, and that talks about the scope of the kingdom. It says there that the mustard seed is very small, but it ends up being a big bush. So the kingdom starts out small, it was just Israel, but it's going to finish large because it's going to include the Gentiles, everybody else. In John 10, 16, Jesus told the Pharisees, I have other sheep that I need to gather into this fold, and he's talking about Gentiles. 
In the next chapter in John 11, 51 to 52, he mentions the same thing. And in Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, he talks about God removing the, um, the law from between Jews and Gentiles, so there's nothing to separate Jews and Gentiles anymore. And now both are made into one body, and they both approach God on the same basis, which is the basis of faith. So the kingdom will grow and will end up large. So those are some ideas that came to mind as I was reviewing this. I don't know if they resonate with you or not, but it's something to consider. Any uh, questions, comments about any of that? Okay. So that takes us basically to verse 33 of chapter 4. We're getting into another section here, and that's that Jesus' authority is revealed in verse, or chapter 4, verses, verse 35, and then going through all of chapter 5. So 33 and 34 kind of wrap up the discussion of the, the um, parables. It says there, and with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them as they were able to hear it. That is, he was making it understandable to them. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. We looked at verse 35 last week, but this gives us a, a time uh, sequence here. It says uh, in verse 35, and on that day when the evening had come, what day is that? Well, if you go back to the beginning of chapter four, it says, and he began to teach again by the sea. Chapter 3 ends with his being in the house, surrounded by a bunch of people so that his family can't even get in to see him. And then chapter 4 starts. How much time lapsed between chapter 3 and 4, we don't know. But that Paul, or excuse me, Mark is not concerned about that. He is just picking incidents throughout uh, Jesus' ministry that illustrate his point that Jesus is an effective servant. So chapter 4 starts with a new incident, and that's his teaching in parables. So this went on all day long, because verse 35 says, when evening had come. It doesn't say that he took a break for lunch. He may have, but it doesn't say so. It doesn't say that he took an afternoon power nap. <laughs> he may have, but it doesn't say that. Okay. So he's been at this all day long. And if you've done any kind of teaching, you know that it can be exhausting. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you're you're pouring out everything you've got. You know, <laughs> and by the time you're finished, you're just wiped out. And we'll see that as we go into this next section. Um, so this is evening, and it says, "He said to them, let us go over to the other side.' Now they're in Capernaum." So we're getting our context here. So the first way Jesus' authority is revealed here is by calming the sea, verse, or chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. So he says, let's go to the other side. They're in Capernaum, the north. And if you have that map handy that I gave you before, you can check this out. I'm going to have a map up here on the screen in a minute. So <laughs> it's not as big as that one, but it'll do. <clears throat> The point here is um, they're getting in the boat and they're going on the other side. And notice what it says in verse 36. And leaving the multitude, that word leaving really means to dismiss, to send away. And it, in the other sections where Jesus has been talking to people, it always says he sent them away. So he probably sent the crowds away. And notice they, the disciples, took him along with them just as he was in the boat. They didn't even go back into town to eat or to get a change of clothes. They just got in a boat and took off. Why would they do that? What would happen if they went back into town? They'd be mobbed again because <laughs> a 
He's, everywhere he goes, the multitudes follow him. So they're going to get out of there while they can. And it says, other boats were with them. And we, excuse me. <clears throat> if we go back to chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, we get some, an idea of the crowd that is with him here. Uh, verse 13 of chapter 3 says, He went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. So he summoned a whole bunch of people. It doesn't say how many, but out of that group, he chose twelve. Well, those people are still with him, that whole group, not just the twelve. And if you go to chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the 12. So this is that same group of people. Probably a sizable group, plus the 12. So in verse 36, there are other boats with them. They need more than one boat. This is a typical fishing boat, maybe about 20 feet long. You get four or five people in there. If you get any more, it might be unstable. <laughs> so they needed several boats for all these people. So this is the map of the Galilee area, the Sea of Galilee there. And Jesus and his disciples are at the top there, Capernaum. And he's going to the other side. And we'll see where they end up in a minute. That phrase, the other side, is a little nebulous, <laughs> ambiguous, <laughs> because how many sides to the sea are there? Okay. Uh, we'll see. So verse 37, they're on their way over to the other side, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. It happened quick. More water is coming into the boat than they can bail out of the boat. Verse 38 is interesting. And he himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. The storm is blowing. <laughs> the boat's filling up with water and he's asleep. Well, he's been teaching all day. <laughs> he's exhausted. So, and maybe the rocking of the boat put him to sleep. <laughs> you know? So he's asleep, but the, the disciples aren't. It says, they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? <laughs> we're about to die and you're asleep? <laughs> Help. It's good at least that they recognize that they were not in control here. <laughs> and they go to the one who is in control. They had seen him heal. They had seen him cast out demons. So they know he's got power. So, you know, save us. 39 is great. And being aroused... He rebuked the wind. The word rebuke there is the same word he used in chapter 1, verse 25, when he rebuked the demon. The demon said, you know, demon identified him as the son of God, and he said, don't say that. I don't need negative press here. So, the same word to rebuke means to resist. And he said to the sea, you ever talk to the trees? <laughs> <laughs> He said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. The word died down there is, it comes from the word for toil, toil that leads to exhaustion. That's the word that Paul used in uh, Colossians chapter 1 when he talked about the, his efforts in their behalf, his labor in their behalf. It means labor is really hard work that leads to exhaustion. So this is the verb form of that, and it means basically kind of like the wind blew itself out, but he stopped it. Okay. It reminds me of a video, you may have seen it on America's Funniest Home Videos or something like that. There's a little kid, he must have been seven, eight years old, and he was upset about something, he was crying about it, and his mother was just letting him cry. 
And it got to a point where you could tell he wasn't crying anymore. He was acting like he was crying, but he really wasn't crying. He had run out of tears. You know? And so he's just faking it. And his mother knew that. And so his mother says to him, are you done? He said, yeah, <laughs> went away. <laughs> so, same thing here. He's all out of tears, you know, and the, here the wind is, is quieted, has died down. So this verb basically means to cease through being spent with toil or to cease raging, which is what we have here. Uh, his response to the disciples is interesting. He said, and he said to them, why are you so timid? Some versions say afraid, but it's the word to be cowardly. Like, what are you afraid of? He says, how is it that you have no faith? Years ago here, I presented a, a Wednesday night Bible study from this passage, but Luke's uh, version of it, parallel passage. I think I titled it, What Are You Afraid Of? And the point is, you know, if God is in your boat, using a boat as a metaphor for life, <laughs> if God is in your boat, what do you have to worry about? I mean, he's in the back of, in the boat here asleep. If the Son of God is asleep in the boat, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> Nothing. You know, what would have happened if they hadn't awakened him and the boat had sunk? We don't know what would happen because <laughs> we didn't go that far. It would have been interesting, though, <laughs> to find out. You know, but if God is in your boat, then what do you have to worry about? If he's not worried about it, why should you be worried about it? Yeah. That brings up a little discussion of worry. I heard a good definition of worry. Worry is the result of taking responsibility for things that are out of your control. You want to make sure that things turn out right, but you can't because you're not in charge of that. And so you worry about it. It's got to come out right, but you can't do anything, so you worry. Two responses to that. If you can do something about the situation, then do it and don't worry. <laughs> do what you can. If you can't do anything about the situation, then why worry about it? <laughs> it's out of your control. That worrying about it isn't going to help. It isn't going to accomplish anything. So the Son of God is there in the back of the boat, and he's not worried about this. So he says, why didn't you have faith? You know, I'm right here. Nothing's going to happen to you as long as I'm here. Their response, verse 41, they became very much afraid. In the Greek, it says they feared a great fear. That's a Hebrew a way of saying things. It's to add emphasis. The repetition adds emphasis. So they feared a great fear. And why? And they said to one another, who is this guy? <laughs> They've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him heal people, but they don't have the full picture of who he is. I mean, technically, God could heal people and cast out demons through another human being. Okay, but here he's doing it all on his own. So they're starting to get the picture. This is more than just a guy, <laughs> more than just another guy. So who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is something, it's one thing to cast out a demon. It's one thing to, to heal somebody, but to stop a storm? <laughs> now, who's got control of the weather? No, nobody does except God. This is the same thing they said in, in chapter 1, verse 27. The people saw him cast out the demon, and they said, Wow, who is this guy that even the demons obey him? So the disciples have the same response here. This is beyond our experience. This is something that's unimaginable. It, it's, kind of, it's a lesson that they will have to learn again, as we will see as we go through this. They slowly get the picture of who he is. <clears throat> so his, his authority is demonstrated then in, in calming the sea and the storm, because only God can do that. Secondly, his, 
his authority is going to be revealed in casting out a demon, chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. And we go back to the map here. They went from Capernaum. Well, let's read it in the text, first of all. Verse 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. And they came to the other side of the sea. That's where they said they were going back in 36, 436. And when he had come, excuse me, finish verse 1, the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes is not on the map, but it's on the eastern coast. So they went across from Capernaum, kind of cut the corner off of the Sea of Galilee, and the Gerasene area is there on the east coast of, of the Sea of Galilee. So while he's there, verse 2, and when he had come out of the boat, oh, by the way, this is Gentile territory. Okay, he's not going to Jews. This goes back to what we were talking about before. The kingdom is going to include everybody, not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. So he is t giving the Gentiles here an opportunity to join the kingdom. Okay. Verse 2, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. I can't uh, go any further without first doing a grammar lesson. <laughs> Drives me nuts. I, I faced this problem over and over and over again when I was teaching English composition. Student, this is a typical mistake students make. I always told my students, stay away from that little word, with. It'll get you in trouble every time. <laughs> because people don't know how to use it. In English, what this says is, a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit. It sounds as though the tombs have the unclean spirit. English depends on word order. And so the modifier is right next to the tomb. So it naturally, it would apply to the tombs. But it wasn't the tombs that had the evil spirit, it was the man. So a better way to translate this into smoother English would say immediately a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. So we got to get the spirit in the man and not in the tombs. <laughs> so that's just a side point. We don't charge extra for that. Now verses 3 through 5 kind of is a... Uh, it gives us background information about this guy. Okay. Verse 3 says, And he had his dwelling among the tombs. By the way, the word tomb here is the word for memorial. It's not the usual word for a grave. Uh, but this word, it, it's... We get our word mnemonic from it, a memory device, something to help you remember something. It's a memorial. That's what the tomb was. The tombs are above ground, not underground. Okay, so it's a memorial of the person who died. All right, you see the tomb, you remember the person. By the way, another side point here. Epitaph. What is an epitaph? That's those little things you read on the, on the tombstones. Here lies so-and-so, you know. Yeah, an inscription, but officially they're an epitaph. Why an epitaph? Because <laughs> the little prefix epi means above, and taph is the Greek word for the grave. So epitaph literally means above the grave. So it's what's written on the tombstone because the tombstone is above the grave. So that's another freebie. So he had his dwelling among the tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Anymore? That sort of implies that they used to be able to do that. And we'll look more into that in a minute even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. 
That's a lot of power. Demons can give people superhuman power, but there's a problem with that, which we'll get into with the next verse. Number five, and constantly, night and day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and gashing himself with stones. Demons are destructive. They destroy the people they inhabit. Now, let's look at what this guy is doing. The demons are giving him superhuman strength so he can break ropes and chains and shackles. Can you imagine the damage that would do to his arms and his legs if they put chains around his wrists and he just snaps the chains? That's got to cut into his skin and his muscles and his bones. I mean, he's got super strength, but he's still a human being. And gashing himself with stones... That word gashing means to cut down or to cut into pieces. This is, these are deep cuts. They're not just surface scrapes and scratches. And no wonder he's crying out because he's in pain. You know, the demons are doing this to him. This kind of reminds me of that TV series you may remember from back in the 70s, The, the Six Million Dollar Man, where the guy, I think he's a test pilot or something like that, and he crashes and he's almost dead, but... They rebuild him and they give him robotic arms and legs so he can, becomes really strong and he can lift heavy stuff and run really fast and all that. And I'm watching that and I'm saying, yeah, that's a strong mechanical arm, but it's attached to a human shoulder. <laughs> if he can lift up a car with one arm, that's going to tear that arm right out of the shoulder. It isn't going to work. Yeah. And that series was followed up by another one. You may remember the bionic woman. Same thing. <clears throat> and same problem. The bionics, bionics might be superhuman, but they're attached to humans. <laughs> so they're not going to, really not going to work. So we have here the same thing. This guy is being tormented by the demons. Verse 6. And seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. Now, wait a minute. Verse 3 said, or verse 2 said, he already went there. And when he, Jesus, had come out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs met him. So verse 6, verse 6 is really taking us back before verse 2. The guy is in the tombs, and obviously the tombs were near the shore. Otherwise, how would he see him? Well, from a distance, okay, but close enough for him to see him. So verse 6 is his first sight of him, and then we get to verse 2 where he runs up to him. So he runs up and bows down before him. Verse 7, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Notice in all cases, the same thing happened in chapter 1 and chapter 2 when he's casting out the demons. They do the same thing. They bow down. They come to him and they bow down and they identify him. He's their enemy. <laughs> Why are they running toward him? They have to. He's their boss. <laughs> He's God. They are angels. They are subservient. It reminds me of the first two chapters of Job where the angels are coming, reporting to God about what they've been doing and the devil is among them because he is an angel. He's still accountable to God. So the demons are accountable to God, and so they run toward him because they have to. They have no choice. That phrase, what do I have to do with you, the same thing is said in previous encounters with demons. It's another uh, Hebrew expression. Uh, in, in English, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It just says, what to you and to me. <laughs> but it means... What, is, what are we doing here? <laughs> what does this have to do with either of us? Kind of thing. So they are his enemy. He is their enemy. So why are you here? And he gets kind of a hint as to why he's here. The rest of the verse, I implore you by God, do not torment me. The word implore here means to, to take an oath. He wants Jesus to promise him that he's not going to torment him. We have the same word used 
in uh, Matthew 26, when Jesus is on trial in front of the Sanhedrin, the high priest says in the King James, I adjure you by a living God, tell us whether or not you're the Messiah. It's kind of an intensive form of the word, but it's the same word, take an oath, you know, swear to this. So I implore you, do not torment me. And the word torment uh, means to test by rubbing something against a touchstone, a standard, comparing something to a standard. God is the standard, and his standard is his righteousness. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's his standard. We all fail to match that standard. So the, the uh, demons don't want that kind of scrutiny. It also means, by extension, to question someone by applying torture. This is the third degree. <laughs> you, you want information, so you put them on the rack and you torture them until they give you the, the information you want. So he doesn't want that kind of torment. And he explains why he told him that, verse 8, for he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Hey, Terry, yeah. just a question. Does this also show that those demons recognize Jesus from his pre-incarnate form? Um, probably. I mean, they were all there in heaven together before Satan rebelled and took... Because otherwise, if he didn't exist prior to his incarnation, how would they know that he right. has such sovereignty and power? Right. Yeah. They had to know who he was. Yeah which means they were also aware of the Incarnation. <laughs> okay, so he's telling him to come out and he doesn't want to come out. That's kind of torture to him. We have to be careful here. Um, we're not going to get into a discussion of demonology and what demons are like and all that. Uh, wouldn't be consistent with our <laughs> current focus and I think a lot of what people say about demons and demonology is, is based on picking verses from here and there and kind of putting them together. I'm not sure it's all legitimate. Some of it is. Some of it's very clear what the Bible says demons are like and stuff. But they would take a passage like this, uh, especially when it gets down later, when, the, when the, the demons ask if they can go into the swine. People say, well, demons need to possess, they need to inhabit, you know, that's their nature. I'm not so sure about that. I, mean, I don't think you can get that from this passage. That's kind of like extrapolating, taking an idea from here and applying it over here where it may not belong. But in this case, um, they wanted to inhabit. They're, well, they're destructive. If you take this guy, if you kick the demon out of this man, they're not going to be able to destroy this man, so they want something else to destroy. So let's back up and, and uh, catch our sequence here. Verse 9, And he, Jesus, was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. The word legion, of course, is a military term. And it, it means a complete army of both infantry and cavalry, upwards of 5,000 soldiers, and some sources say 6,000. Can you imagine being inhabited by that many demons? Well, they're spiritual beings, so it's possible for them to fit, okay, um, <clears throat> within this guy. This may be why back to verse 3 when it says no one was able to bind him anymore maybe more demons came along in uh, Matthew chapter 12 43 to 45 Jesus gives another parable and he, he, a demon is cast out and so the guy's life is all cleaned up but if you don't replace the demon with God then the demon's going to come back he says he'll bring seven more demons with him. So that may have happened here, since there are so many. It doesn't say that, we don't know, but the any more back in verse 3 seems to me to imply that things got worse for this guy. And 
And he began to entreat him earnestly not to send him out of the country. The word entreat is also the word translated implore in some translations. This is a different word than the word implore in verse 7. The word implore in verse 7 means take an oath or promise. This word means to call beside. It's the same, it's the verb form of the word used for the Holy Spirit in uh, John 14 and 16 when Jesus said he would send the helper. This is the verb form of that word helper, parakletos, which means to call alongside, usually to help. At least that's what it's uh, intended for the Holy Spirit. He's called alongside to help or to aid. It can also mean to call to produce a particular effect. And that's kind of what we have here. The demon is asking him to do something or not to do something. So he's calling him to achieve a particular effect. He has a desire uh, not to be expelled from the country. And by the way, the same word implore or entreat here is used in Verses 12, 17, 18, 23, and others. It's repeated quite a bit here. So he says not, he didn't want to, him to send him out of the country. A couple issues there. He already, this demon, this legion of demons, already has a foothold in that country. Again, this is Gentile country. And maybe he didn't want to lose that that foothold in that country, so don't send me away. In Luke's account, the demon said, don't send me to the abyss, which is the proper place for demons. Uh, Matthew 25 says that God created hell for Satan and his angels, not for people. Anybody, any people who go to hell go there because they want to. They choose to. <laughs> Instead of taking God's escape, they choose to take the judgment instead. So they're taking Satan's side, and therefore they suffer Satan's punishment. So that's the abyss. That's where the, the, the uh, demons belong in judgment. We have the same idea in the book of Jude. He talks about the, these false teachers having their doom already established in this kind of situation. So whether it's out of the country or whether it's um, the abyss, they both apply. And this brings up another point. We've talked about this before. You're going to have variance in the reading of the Gospels because you have four people looking at the same incidents from four different points of view. So they're going to emphasize different things. You know, some people, one person is going to say, this is an important incident. And another person says, well, that's not important as this one, so I'm not going to talk about that one. I'll talk about this one. So you're going to have differences. It's not a big deal. We know what those differences are, and we can account for them. My tablet just shut off here. Sorry about that. <laughs> so don't send them out of the country. Verse 11, now there was a big, that's an understatement, a big herd of swine feeding there on the mountain, the cliffs next to the sea. And the demons, that's added, uh, goes back to uh, the, uh, the demons that Jesus was talking with here. And they make it plural in New American Standard. The demons entreated him. You'll notice throughout this passage, sometimes it refers to the demon in the singular and sometimes in the plural. Well, there, is a, there were obviously many demons, <laughs> a legion of them. So that's where the plural comes in. But there was, it seems to be one who was the spokesman. So it's the one doing the talking. So sometimes it's singular because you're talking to that spokesman. Other times it's plural because it's a reference to all the demons together. So the demons entreating him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. 
and he gave them permission. Notice they're, they're not in charge. They can do a lot of bad things, but they're not in charge. God's in charge. They have to ask permission. So he gives them permission. And people have read into this that, you know, these were Jews raising swine and the, the law was against pigs. They were unclean. So Jesus was helping the Jews get rid of their breaking of the law. But these aren't Jews. <laughs> these are Gentiles, okay? So if they want to raise pigs, they can raise pigs. Um, <clears throat> there's another issue which we'll see here in a minute with, with this herd of swine so the unclean spirits entered the swine verse 13 and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea about 2,000 of them and they were drowned in the sea that's a big herd of pigs there's a lot of money there, folks. It's a huge investment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a huge investment. So <clears throat> he was a threat to the economy, which is why they asked him to leave a little later, I think. Verse 14, and their herdsmen, the people in charge of the herd of swine, ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. And the people came to see what it was what it was that had happened. This kind of reminds you of Luke chapter two with the shepherds. They go and find the baby in the manger and they go back and start telling everybody about it. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing, except these are not shepherds, they're swine herds. But it's kind of the same thing. Spreading the news. Um so all the people come out to see what's happening after the shepherds or the, the swine herds tell them about it. And they, all the people in the city and the country who had heard what was going on, they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. The word observe there is one we've come across before, chapter 3, verse 11. It means to look at something with interest and for a purpose, to carefully observe the details. In 3.11, it talks about the demon in the synagogue observing Jesus as he's teaching. He's <laughs> focused on him. Like, what is he going to do next? Well, here, they're looking at this man that they know was demon-possessed. And now, he's not possessed anymore. He's acting normal. And they're, they're looking at that. Is this the same guy? Yeah, it's the same guy. So they are observing him. They're looking at him carefully, looking at the details. And he's sitting down, clothed in his right mind. That's another um, single word there in the Greek. That's a com compound word, the word wisdom and the word mind. It, or excuse me, not the word wisdom, but the word salvation or saved. It means a saved mind, a delivered mind, uh, a healed mind. So it means to be a sound mind or to be in one's right mind or to be sober-minded. So he's no longer screaming. He's no longer cutting himself. He's no longer a wild man. And it says, the very man who had had the legion. So there's no question, this is the guy, the very man. And they became frightened. <laughs> the same reason the disciples were frightened in the boat. You know, there's power here. Who can heal? Who can cast out a demon like this? What's their response? Well, verse 16, those who had seen it, who had seen this man delivered, described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. The word described there is an intensive form of a word which means to give an account. It means to conduct a narration through to the end. They didn't leave anything out. <laughs> they were detailed in, in indicating what Jesus had done to heal this guy and what had happened to the swine and all of that. They didn't leave anything out. What's the result? 
verse 17, they, the people of the area, began to entreat him to depart from their region. Isn't it interesting? The demons run toward Jesus. The people run away from him. Well, the people don't recognize their <laughs> obligation <laughs> to submit to God. The demons do. Well, he just cost them a ton of money. You know? So they're saying, we don't need you around here if you're going to cause these problems. So they ran him out of town. Verse 18, and as he was getting into the boat, notice he doesn't argue. He has demonstrated his authority as God by healing, casting out this demon, healing this man. That should have been enough evidence that he was who he says he was, <laughs> that he was God and should have gotten a response from them, a response of faith, submission to this power. But instead, they reject him. So what else is he going to do? He, he gave them the offer. They rejected it. So he leaves. I mean, what more can he do? And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been a demon-possessed was ent entreating him that he might accompany him. And there's that word entreating again. That he might accompany him. But verse 19 and Jesus, it is, he did not let him, but he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So it wouldn't do you any good to follow me. <laughs> I need you to stay here and tell all your people about this. So the people initially who heard about this rejected the offer. But now God is giving, giving them a second chance. He's sending a missionary <laughs> to this people. He's one of their own. And he is evidence of God's power. They all knew him. Verse 20, and he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. It doesn't say they believed, <laughs> but they marveled. They were astounded at this. How could this have happened? They knew who he was. And by the way, Decapolis is not on the map here. It's to the southeast of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you see the places there, Gersa and Gadara. Well, it extends down further than that. It's called Decapolis. Deca is 10 and Polis is city. So it's a land where there are 10 major cities, Decapolis. And so he goes down there to all those cities, <laughs> telling all the people about his being delivered from the demon. And all the people are amazed at it. They marvel. It doesn't say they repented, <laughs> but at least they're astounded by this. <clears throat> uh, well, we're out of time. So we'll pick up here next time and we'll see another way that his authority is revealed, and that's through various healings, verses 21 to 43. That's 21 to the end of the chapter. So any, any comments, observations about any of that? Okay. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father, again, we thank you that you are who you are that you have provided evidence of who you are and have clarified the responsibility of people to respond to the proclamation of who you are. We thank you that you've given us the ability to do that. We pray that you will strengthen us as we give other people that opportunity. In Jesus' name, 